Hello, my name is Carol May Wittick and welcome to Her Conversations, Tools for the Awakening Woman. Her is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. This is the optimal state to embody in order to attract our highest desires. Who is the Awakening Woman? She is a woman who is seeking a greater possibility in her reality and looking for solutions. She knows being awakened is not a lofty ideal but a necessity. If she can transform herself, she can change the world. Her conversations will introduce you to talented women who will speak to your spirituality, sensuality and soul. They'll share their stories and explain how they are in service to the world. So let their words and these conversations embolden and inspire you. My guest on this week's Her Conversations is spiritual coach, designer and author of The Awakening Ones, A Journey to Enlightenment, Angelica Christie. She uses the wisdom acquired on her inner journey as a catalyst to serve humanity. Her purpose and passion is guiding people along the path of personal transformation. During our conversation, we talk about learning and healing from challenging family dynamics, effective ways to nurture our body and protecting and choosing our reality. Angelica's insight and knowledge is much deeper than we explored on this episode, but for those embarking on their awakening journey, this is a great start. So as always, I begin each episode by asking my guests, HER is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. When do you feel your most HER? I feel that when I am in a state of just being the balanced observer, like being able to really look at life um, and love everything I see, no matter what's happening. And it's, it's not even loving it. It's just acknowledging it. It's just, um, supporting whatever is taking place because I do know on such a deep level that each of us is connected to that for some reason, or we wouldn't even be able to view it. It wouldn't even come into our energy field. So I do really, um, feel like I'm in my uh, most sacred spa- self or space, I'm not including say states of meditation or something like that. But when I'm in the world and I can really just observe people and their conflicts and what's happening around me and just be um, in love and gratitude, because I know it's just also an affirmation uh, that I'm not getting sucked into it where I realized maybe six months or a year before I would have been triggered by it or sucked into it. So yeah. And I really do believe family is our best um, teacher. You know, people, a lot of people don't want to be around their families because they're this, they're that, they're the other thing. But I really believe that we divinely um, chose them for a reason for ourselves. And it has nothing to do with anyone else. And um, and before we go further into that as well, I just wanted to give you an opportunity just to introduce yourself to the listener and and so say who you are. And um, just as a precursor to that as well, we attempted to do this interview maybe six months ago, and we had like the roughest of internet connections. And this is kind of round two. Um, with with us uh, recording our episode but in that in the interim we've been through so much and it's really it seems like it's 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 pertinent that we have both kind of taken time away and gone through what we've gone through that I think will feed what we what we discuss even more um but you know just talk about yourself for a moment and then we'll really get into that I came into this world with an innate knowing that we were all connected, that there was this amazing goodness, that we are also the creators of our own life. Um, I was a healer of um, animals and even plants. I knew as a child that I could take St. John's wort and put it in amongst other plants and they all seemed to flourish better. There's just this knowing I think each one of us came in with, but unfortunately, a lot of times it's squashed down or um, rejected, or we, even as a child, we're so ultra sensitive that if we get a look from a family member, um, some authority that's important to us, that there's something wrong with us, or they're questioning who we are, I think we start shutting those parts of ourselves down. So I do believe that we were all very high beings. And, and so as a child, making 
potions, as my sister used to say, I called them to heal animals or, uh, you know, whatever I could get my hands on. And I was very creative, too. I was always redoing all the bedrooms and designing things. So that's what I had a real creative path as a child. And um, as I grew up in a, a large family, there was nine in our family, seven kids. And, um, you know, so I had six siblings and most of them are more academic. And I don't think any of anyone understood me at all. Uh, my mother more so because she's an artist, but um, so it felt really lonely growing up. And there seemed to be a lot of wanting to fit in because that's supposed to be my tribe. That's supposed to be the ones that, you know, you watch the Kodak commercials from way back. And I would, you know, see that once in a while. And I just want to cry because that was not my family. They'd have these family gatherings and everybody's happy. And, you know, and it was like, whose family is that? Because it's sure not mine, or at least I didn't feel it was mine. So um, growing up, I always um, had this like direct channel and I didn't know what it was from or who it was from. It, it didn't matter. It was a collective energy that came through. So even uh, pre-Catholic grammar school starting in um, kindergarten, actually, I was put into at Sunday, you know, the Sunday services where they put the kids in catechism. And even then I had a really, really difficult time with what they were saying. And I was very quiet as a child, but there's something in me that is a definite heretic um, for what I believe is truth. And so even as a five-year-old, um, four-year-old, I was speaking up against the nuns and the priests when they would say, Jesus this and Mary Magdalene that, she was a sinner and she was a whore and all that. And I knew it was a lie. And I used to defend both of them saying, no, that's not true. And so then as a child, of course, I think I've mentioned this, you, you, you really um, learn to be quiet. You know, you learn not to say anything. So my whole life has been like that. It, it's been challenging. And um, even in the third and fourth grade, I got sent to the office all the time at my uh, Catholic school because if the big monsignors came in or these big wigs, I, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. And I just say, that's not true. Jesus would never say that. He would never do that. He never wanted that from us. He, it wasn't about shame or uh, blame it was or better than. And so I'd end up in the office. So again, I learned to just be silent. And, you know, long story short, um, I just went away from that, had my own beliefs, kept them to myself. Uh, the minute I graduated from the eighth grade, I, I got, I did not want to go to another Catholic school. So I kind of went wild for a while, which was really fun. Um, got to play in all kinds of groups of people from all different kinds of um, schools. And that was really fun because I really, again, could see how these different groups of people were all at the core, basically the same. They all wanted to be loved. They all, we, all wanted to be acknowledged. They all wanted to have, uh, feel they were important or valuable or heard. Um, and so it was really um, an interesting time because I think all of life has always been this observation for me. I've always been observing life. So it's people's reactions, my reactions. Um, and where did that come from and how do I heal it? So that's when later in life I became an interior designer. I came, uh, you know, uh, I do Venetian plasters and faux finishes because I went to Europe at 18 years old and saved all my money and went for, at the time you could go for six months. And I took advantage of that. So I was all over Europe. So I got to see different cultures. I got to experience these old world towns and villages and people that were all the same. You know, they were all the same everywhere I went. I always found these beautiful souls that showed up for me just when I needed someone. So when people say things are ugly in the world or there's these terrible people here or there, I thank God didn't know that. I wasn't smart enough to know that. I ended up going in high school to Oakland High School, which was supposed to be this horrible, lots of gangs, this and that, you know, and it's like, it was because that wasn't my experience. Um, 
I had none of that, even though I hung out with the people from Holy Names and St. Mary's and Bishop O'Dow and Skyline, I didn't experience it. I didn't come into contact with one person that was mean to me. Because if you show up authentically in life, and I remember going up the stairs one time, and I used to be really cute when I was young, going up the stairs and um, this guy, you know, pinched me. And I turned around, I just belted him. And he looked at me and it was this black guy. And he looked at me and he goes, I didn't do what he did. And he points to the guy behind him. And so he turned around, I said, well, then you hit him. And he turned around and hit him. <laughs> but my two friends, Sheila and her sister Lorraine, who were two black gals, but I didn't know that. Like, I didn't have a concept of that who were in my English class were looking over the top and they're like, hey girl, go girl. You know, and I'm like, oh, because it wasn't a racist thing. You know, it wasn't black or white or anything. It was just like, don't do that. That's not okay, you know? And so I think when you're not disrespecting someone or you're not doing it out of anger, whatever you say and do, people get on some level. Does that make sense? Total sense. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, oh, and, it, and it's like, so I didn't realize there were problems at a school. I didn't realize really there was even a race thing because I didn't grow up with that reality. Like my mother never, you know, the first time I met a, um, a, a what they call black at the time, a colored boy, that's what they call them, colored at that time. I was so excited I couldn't wait to go to school because I heard when I was in the second grade, there was a colored boy that was coming to our school. And I was so excited. Mm -hmm. And because um, I couldn't wait to meet this colored boy. And then when I got there, I was so disappointed. When I got home, my mom said, well, was he nice? And I said, yeah, he was really nice. And she goes, you look disappointed. I said, well, he was just chocolate. And um, she said, what did you think? I said, well, pink and red and blue and yellow because, <laughs> you know, that was colors. So I think as a child, when we lose that innocence and then people start judging what you say, what you do, it's really sad, you know? So I think that's been my whole life. I've never had a thing about race or color or religion. It's about how someone shows up. So that's when I got into coaching and counseling and mostly my own spiritual journey of really deep healing and any trigger in the world, anything that triggers me, I know it's mine. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's a gift. The shadow is a gift to um, find the diamond within it. It's truly a gift. So that was really long winded. But anyway, <laughs> so right now, I mean, I wrote a book. Yeah. Um, called The Awakening Ones. It's been on Amazon for a while. And um, that was just transmissions that have come through for years. It came through of really clarifying the story of the relationship of Yeshua or Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. So it was something that was turned into a fiction. So it was more digestible and readable because it also had way too much factual information originally that it was just going to be you know, turn into something I didn't want it to turn into in the world. Mm. So anyway, I'm um, opening a new company called ascensionangels.com. And it's just healing tools, because that's what I realized on the planet. It's like, why am I here? What, how can I serve? You know, and it's like, yes, I love coaching. I love all these other, um, these other modalities, the coaching and all that. Uh, but also, what can help rise the vibration? Because I understand the power of sound. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm almost going back to my childhood when I understood the energy, like using my hands and letting the energy, connecting with the divine and letting the energy go through and heal little birds or, you know, um, I, everything, little ducks. I mean, you know, I dragged it home and um, mm -hmm. worked with them and even butterflies. So it was, uh, it's going back to that the healing tools that can help us stay centered in what seems like a really chaotic world. Mm -hmm. And yet really we've been asked for clarity. We've asked for authenticity. We've asked for transparency, but most people are asking in the outer world, but they don't realize what they're really asking is themselves for that. 
So anything that's not transparent, that's not authentic, that's not high vibration um, is coming up to be thrown at us. That's how I look at the world right now. So each one of them, I have the opportunity to go in and work in and find the aspect within myself that triggers that and heal that and love that. So that's my journey. Perfect, thank you. And and as as um, we said a little bit earlier, we were talking about family and how they're our greatest teachers, our greatest challenge. And um, you know, I, I in the interim of our first attempt at recording this, and now. Um, I know that I've gone back into the family fold and experienced some things that were really tough. And now that I can see how much of a lesson they were, um, what has been your experience and your learning of this as well? Yeah, I think I've shared some of these stories before in my own uh, videos, but I think it's important because I hear over and over as well as I know you do that you know, people that stay away from their families. They don't want anything to do with their families uh, because they deem them in a certain way. And for me, they are my greatest teachers um, besides my children, but my family even more so because I'm never gonna let go of my children. No matter what happens, we're gonna work through something. But as far as um, relatives it's, and siblings, uh, parents, it's really easy to shut the door. And then we just have all these things playing out in the world that actually it's the same lesson and same energy. So often it'll bring us back when we start healing something out in the world, then we'll, we'll somehow reconnect on some level with family members. And we really get to see how far we've gone. Mm. And I didn't realize how um, damaged I was as a child for wanting my siblings approval like to fit in um i didn't feel like i fit into that their world and um there was some level that child level that really wanted that and so often when we go back to in family situations and something gets triggered you're not the adult anymore you become this whatever it was when the wound happened so it, you be, you responding like a five year old, you're responding like a seven year old or a ten year old or whatever, and that's when we get to catch ourselves and go, wow, you know, what's this, what's this really about? And it was like, oh wow, it's he said this really mean thing. This was one of my brothers. I I over, I was told by a mutual friend something he said up in Tahoe when they were all skiing about me behind my back. And it was, it was inaccurate and it was mean. And she, she even said to him, wow, she doesn't talk about you like that, you know? Um, and then she told me, which was kind of interesting too, because you, know, yeah. you always have those people that tell, <laughs> even though they say they're not gossips, but it was, it, it I, I, I was grateful that she told me because it triggered something inside. So I got to go in and say, what part of me doesn't believe I'm valuable enough to have what he's accusing me of? What part of um, me even cares what he says? Mm -hmm. Because I know what he said is, is like from somebody that got hearsay from this person and that person and that person that didn't even know you. I mean, my brother doesn't know me. We, we see each other maybe twice a year. There's no way he can know me, right? And that's for each one of us. Um, we, you know, we're not known, uh, our, our close friends know us. They see the highs and the lows and what we've achieved and what we're going through. But most family members don't. Um, they get snippets of our life and then they're trying to put something together. It's just like fake news. You know, it's like, they take a little tiny part of something and then they blast that all over the internet. And it's so out of context, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, you know, you just, and I learned that early on when I used to be really politically involved when I was younger and I wouldn't talk to newspapers anymore because I realized they twisted, not only twisted what I said, but they actually cut it up. So it meant something entirely different. Like if I said, well, I really hate when, this congressman 
doesn't think about the people. Well, they would just chop that and put, I really hate this congressman. Whoa, you know, (laughs) I mean, it was like, so finally I said, no, I won't do an interview unless you let me okay what you're going to print before. And they said, no, we can't do that. The editors don't allow that. And that's when I knew, and this was 25 years ago. So I knew then how fake the news was based on sponsors, based on who owned the newspapers or the television stations. So, you know, it's kind of like that in life. They don't know us. And Mm -hmm. so why do we care? You know, if, if we're showing up authentically every day as the best person we can be, and it's okay. And so I went through a whole bunch of healing work with several of my uh, family members within myself. I didn't even need to talk to them, but within myself, because I come to the Napa Valley a lot to help my 91 year old mother. And I was driving from Oregon for 10 hours. And at one time I was living in San Diego, that was, you know, eight hours back and forth and they wouldn't come and they're an hour away. So there was a part of me that was angry about that. The expectations I had of them. Why aren't they showing up? Why aren't they do this? You know, I'm like the martyr. And I didn't look at it as the martyr syndrome, but it, it, it was because I'm like, I drive 10 hours each way and that it, I lost a good job because of this. And you guys can't even show up. That's what I'm playing out in my mind. Um, and so it was like, I don't have to come. You know, it was that realization, I don't have to show up. Well, nobody else is. I still don't have to. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to. It's my, I choose to. I choose to show up for this woman that gave birth to me and raised me the best she knew how. Even if it wasn't the way I would have liked to be raised, it was the best she knew how. And it was obviously for my highest good, um, or else I wouldn't have picked her as a parent. And same with my siblings. So it hit me one day wow, I don't want them to have an expectation of me of how I should be or show up. So why should I have an expectation of them, how they show up or don't show up? And it was a really hit me hard. And then I stopped having expectations of my own mother, how she should show up as the perfect mom. Because really, we all have this image of how somebody is supposed to show up in our life. And it's a false image based on this Kodak moment, this fantasy, you know, television show that we've got running here. Um, And yet, if we had the ideal siblings, the ideal parents, that's the end of the story. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, what is there to learn? How is there, how do we grow? We can't grow. There's nothing to challenge us. We become this rock with moss growing off of it. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Family's good. And when you can be in their presence, like I was last Christmas with them and realize I had nothing but love for them and nothing triggered me no matter what they say. And because I shifted, they shifted. And it was really interesting to watch. So they're great teachers. Definitely. Hard lessons, but great yeah, teachers. But like you say, the, the, the best ones are are the toughest ones. I like what you said about um, Kodak moments, and um, I feel that the the world in itself that there is a like you say there's there's a there's a greater awakening. There are people who are having a different conversation or a different awareness about you know they're they're starting their spiritual journey. Maybe there seems to be like a second wave and more of a mass talk of things in the mass media or just in the mass populace that people are being slightly more aware of things, slightly more aware of the fact that they actually have choices, slightly more aware of the fact that maybe the the way that they were led to believe that life was, you know, this Kodak perfect moment, you know, this is the way that your life is prescribed. You do this at this age, at this age, this age, this age. This is the food that you eat. These are the things that you are set to achieve. Rarely works for anybody. And so many people are starting to step out and talk about their truth. And um, and, it, and it's just interesting to see. And I mean, at how the, the question or the, the point I'm trying to ask you of as as 
the ones who, you know, have been the ones that have always been the outliers or the outsiders or the ones who've been the crazy ones that are slightly now seeing, uh, you know, just, just everyone's starting to question things a little bit more. How can we be empathetic and, 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 and guide them in a soft way, as, you know, even though we've been waiting for these things to happen for so long, because now that we can have a, a conversation or, or, you know, things that you might have said to somebody five years ago or 10 years ago that suddenly they're repeating back to you. How can we be guide? How can we guide them gently? How can we still be an example instead of trying to, like, rush everyone through? Because it didn't happen overnight for us. I think for me, it's not about helping anyone else because even when I'm coaching clients I look at at, as it is they're helping me get better too and clearer because when we talk out loud when we walk through something so being in someone else's presence we don't need to help them we need to look at our own selves and how are we showing up in this moment did we close our heart did we um, open our heart to them? Did, um, are we hearing them? And I think most of the time people are trying to defend themselves or be heard. And so they're not even listening to what the person is saying. We've heard this forever. But the more you learn to listen to another person and really see what's beneath that, what are they looking for? It's not what they're saying. It's the energetics of what are they looking for? Are they looking for assurance, approval, acceptance? What what is it really? Because the words are nothing. And that's what we have to, for me, that's what I'm really trying to work at. It's not hearing the words, but what's the energy behind the words? You know, we had a couple of political things just happen recently, as we all know. And it, it I was like, wow, your words mean nothing. You know, both this man and this woman, um, It was like, don't pull up religion. Don't pull up these things because you're hiding behind them. Because the energy in their body that was so clear to me had nothing to do with religion or spirituality or goodness. So I think we should always look beneath what someone's saying. And that's why I think there's a lot of people that have wandered the spiritual path for so long. Because we start following somebody that has great words. Mm. And there's so many of these that have several that have passed on now, but they were bestseller, this speakers making tons of money, but underneath their lives were disastrous. So that's what I want to know. Okay. Um, When I'm with someone, am I trying to get any kind of recognition? Am I trying to get anything from them? I guess that's my thing. Do I want something? If I want something, it's not clean. Can I just show up for them and hear them um, and support them? Because I think that is the most beautiful gift to hear someone. And you don't even, even if they say, well, do you agree? Say, well, I think it's an interesting topic. You know, um, I don't agree or disagree or yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. It's not about needing to say, well, I see it like this, and this is my point of view, and I think you're totally wrong. Um, so did I get totally off the subject? <laughs> <laughs> keep talking, don't worry. I meander as well. Let's just keep going. We're good. So, yeah, I think for our families, if we can really hear them, Um, really be present because each one of them, no matter how they look in the world, how successful financially they may look or say their social groups or whatever, underneath there are so many wounds that really either want to be healed, maybe they don't know they're there, um, but just, just, I think the greatest gift we can give anybody is just really, truly doing our own work. To me, everything is um, about energy. Mm -hmm. So um, I I talked about the three levels only because that came up in a dream for me the other night. I mentioned that in a quick YouTube video, but um, that, because I realized 
there's a part of me that wants to know everything about everything because I look at it as this collective, this huge collective I'm a part of right now. So there's times when I'm really balanced when I'm spending an equal amount of time meditating or journaling than when I'm doing something really positive and creative and then a level of looking into all this negative, positive horrors going on, possibly, you know, all this stuff uh, going on in the world. And so the so-called negativity in the world seems to have increased incredibly. But it's if you can just observe it and go, okay, they're talking about this fault line and they're talking about this and they're talking about this. And um, it, it's, it's, it's not letting affect you, it's being aware of it and going, okay, these are all possibilities. Mm. But don't play in one in, in any one world for me. This is only for me for too long. Because I don't know if you ever saw that movie. It was an old one and it didn't probably get out there. Um, it was a lot of colors. Who was it? Um, about worlds and he got sucked into his wife died and he went, Robin Williams went back. Yeah. He went to, um, he went to hell or something like that. Wife. Yeah. He yeah, wanted yeah. to rescue his wife and they, they warned him because she had killed herself because I think their son drowned or something. Mm -hmm. And he, she wanted to rescue him because she was in this dark forgotful place of even who she was. And they warned him, if you're in that energy too long, you will be lost too. You will not only forget who she is, but you will forget who you are. And so, um, you know, that's to me a really huge message of this world. If we're always into, because I went through several years of meditation, writing, that was my world. And yes, I had incredible states of bliss and nothing was wrong in the world. And there was only this unity. But really, I had to you know, there was that wake up call that happened one time was like, yeah, but you're, you're not any good. Like you, you came with an assignment. Each one of us came with something to do. And even if we don't think we're doing it, we're doing it. You know, some level is doing it and it all come together one day. So I realized that I had to dive into this, what I call the artificial world of war and technology and cloning and this and that and cameras watching us and you know gates with his vaccine stuff and you know you're going like uh oh, that's just poisoning the body but hey and it's not it's it's being aware but again it's balancing it with those other things like don't spend all your time looking at doom and gloom on the computer you know or television or reading the paper because that's the energy now you've slipped into and that becomes your reality. Mm. And it doesn't need to be, you know, it's almost like there's, you know, heaven is that bliss part is playing out now. Then you've got purgatory, um, which is just this place in between. And then you've got hell and you don't want to be in any one of those places for too long mm. as far as I'm concerned. So um, yeah, it's, it's, these dimensions are, are, energy based again it's about energy so even food for me and um, and i'm not going to tell people what to do they have to do what they go in internally and realize yeah, yes i need to make a change now unfortunately so many people have so much processed food in them so many chemicals in them that they can't make a rational decision because they've actually wiped out the pineal gland is so calcified mm -hmm. and some of their intuitive sense is so dense that they really can't. So sometimes it takes something kind of harsh for them to go, hey, let me at least give that a try because then they start realizing as they detox, as it cleans out, that there is this clarity. They really understand maybe their purpose more. So as far as food, I remember being in Hawaii um, and it wasn't even a conscious choice. It wasn't thing I thought of before. Like I went to a farm and saw how they treated, 
calves and you know as veal and these tiny little structures or you know or the abuse of animals I, it wasn't even that i was in the grocery store i threw a chicken in my cart and i started walking and then i stopped and i picked it up and i put it back and that was in the early 80s i've never eaten meat or poultry or anything since and people always say oh my gosh you're going to be so unhealthy and this and that well, i'm 65 and i'm still never on medication i don't take drugs, you know? So, okay. Um, but the thing is, when I started looking at what I was naturally began to eat, and then later looked it up when people told me, oh, you're not getting protein and you're not getting this. And it's like, oh, okay. Then looked up, oh, wait a minute, I'm eating avocados, high protein source. I'm eating, I don't get sunflower seeds that are salted and roasted because to me, you've just destroyed it now. I'm <clears throat> eating, you know, raw sunflower seeds, high protein. I mean, kale, high protein, on and on and on and on. And so I have not missed that kind of food for all of these years. Mm. And I remember one time um, trying to be nice at a party. And it was like all they had was like poultry and this and that. And I took a bite and I felt so dense inside. But not only that, I felt really sad. So the more in tune you get, um, the more you realize you're picking up the energy of that. And I'm going to call them beings because I don't see any creature as higher or less. You know, for us to claim that we're superior is um, really extremely arrogant as far as I'm concerned. Like, how are, how are we? I mean, seriously, we do horrific things to each other. Um, look at a dog. He's loyal no matter what. <laughs> Who's the higher spiritual being, you know? But, you know, so I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, the, the people that do eat meat is kind of interesting because a lot of them are dog people or cat people. And if they found out their neighbor was eating dog, they would be up in arms. They would be reporting them. They'd be, you know, but I'm sorry. I don't know the difference. I don't get the difference. Um, it's still a creature and it has feelings. I used to look in my son's cows. He, he, he was allergic to milk. So he wanted to see if he had all organic feed. They were free roaming. He only milked them once a day. What would happen? You know, the baby stayed with their moms. Um, what would happen? Would he still be allergic? Well, he found out he wasn't, but it was very interesting to stand up next to one of these 1200 pound creatures, or maybe it was the babies that were 1200 pound. I remember my son goes, get some real shoes on. You know, they step on your foot and your, your foot's going <laughs> to be broken, but look in their eyes. And there's like an intelligence. Not only that, there's a deep love and compassion that I don't see when I look in most humans' eyes, mm. some kind of knowing. And so, you know, we pick up a flower and look how we adore it, you know, and um, we send that vibration. So I, I just, I feel that if you eat an animal, especially when I go to the I-5, when I go down to San Diego from the Napa Valley and see those cows on the side of the road, those farms, that there are thousands, mud everywhere, one, you know, little shelter, they're all packed in. I mean, literally, I don't even have to know I'm coming up to it, but my heart starts weeping. It, it really does. I'm feeling their energy. And so for people to eat something that was number one, mistreated and knows, knows because everything's connected. They already prove scientifically that trees are connected, flowers are connected. They do one thing to one, and they can read the monitors where every tree in the world has sent nose in X amount of time, got that signal. Mm -hmm. So these animals know what's gonna to happen to them. And so what right do I have? Uh, what right do I have? Especially when it, it really harms the body because the body doesn't know how to process it correctly. And then we wonder why we have all this disease. Yeah. You know, um, anyway, that's my rant to save the animals, <laughs> all animals. <laughs> yeah, of course. And and it's been interesting as well. I don't know if they have it in the States, but every January they, they kind of promote it as Veganuary. So um, 
a lot of the fast food places have been having like the even even KFC had a a vegan thing which is just junk food really it's not really it's not even plant-based you know what I mean it's it doesn't have any animal stuff and so for some people that is a, a you know a step in the in a in a in in the right in the right direction away from animals and and everything like that but did you have you watched um game changers at all on netflix did you see that documentary no no that, that, that? that's a that's a recent that's a recent one i think it just got released say, i'd say in the last three months but what's interesting about that is one of the main um proponents of a plant-based lifestyle is arnold schwarzenegger and he is on there saying, you know, I was Mr. Universe. I grew up, grew up with the myth and the belief that in order to be strong, I needed to eat, you know, loads of chickens and loads of eggs to get the muscles because that's what men do. And I realize now that that's only marketing. And now he's, you know, in his, his 70s and is completely plant-based and he feels a lot better. And it's, it's so there's there's more and more awareness about the fact that it's, um that they that you can survive and actually thrive and be as strong i think the the belief has always been that if you just survive on lettuce that you're going to wither away and you know like the the thing you said said about protein was when i did let people know that i was not going to eat meat anymore that it was interesting the people that were so concerned about where i was going to get my protein from and <laughs> overly concerned about where i was going to get my protein from more so than you know me pointing out to them that they were pre-diabetic you know and and this is the way that things have transpired like five ten years later um and and just understanding that like you say animal protein does nothing for the body anyway and animals get their protein for plants so why not just cut out you know even if you're not going to do it for the animals think of you know do it for, do it for a solely selfish reason do it for your your health and one and wanting to have a different level of, of 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 awareness and a different quality of life but like you say if you've spent 20 30 40 years being dumbed down by the uh, ingesting all the processed food the processed you know the the processed things that we need in that we need in our environment the detergents the the creams and the potions and the medications if you're constantly poisoning yourself it makes it really difficult to find space in the middle of that if you've got to go through this real detoxing period before you even see the light. I mean, even the fact that you every day that you brush your teeth, if you're not using a good toothpaste, you're, you're poisoning yourself because of this belief that fluoride's going to help your teeth, you know? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that you said about um, uh, uh, what you just just said about your teeth uh, because because you mentioned um, Arnold Schwarzenegger mm -hmm. and um, when he actually I thought he was kind of a flake but I wasn't really following him back then so um, he, it was interesting because my dentist he's a natural dentist and it's really funny because I've got like this brown spot on my front tooth and it's just like I'm going to this natural dentist um, Arnold Schwarzenegger actually got when he was in, he got um, uh, a survey done of which dentist had the least extractions, um, the least, you know, um, what do they call them when they pull them out? Root canals, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And his name came up on the top. Well, he tried to share his technique with other dentists, but they weren't interested because he said what happens is they go to school and then they're basically said, okay, if you want to make this much money, then you do this. And if you want to make a hundred thousand, then you do this. And then you want to make 200,000, you tell them you need all these things. Mm -hmm. So it's a big scam. I, you know, the, it really is. And it has a huge, huge lobbyist. Um, they have a, a, a crazy lobbyist, but Arnold Schwarzenegger actually had him part of that study of what he was doing. He doesn't use x-ray. He uses, um, what is it that they use that's non-invasive, um, that What's laser it? beam, <laughs> laser, to take all these photos. Right. But I get, you get to see in real time, like last time and this time, and really what's happening with the teeth. Like this pearlescence is coming from the back forward mm -hmm. in my teeth. So even though this front, because when I was 
uh, five and my uh, wisdom tooth or these front teeth were coming in, I had 105 fever, it actually created a line in my tooth. And every time they used to fill it, a regular dentist, it starts to get brown because I drink a lot of tea. And so then I have to, you know, they fix it. But this time I'm not doing that. And it's really hard. Um, but he showed me how it's pushing forward. Like new tooth is actually um, the old fillings are coming out. They're being pushed out by new tooth. So, you know, the body's exquisite that it was meant to heal itself. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing with the whole seven years, they worked on this and they couldn't get it past the lobbyists. They weren't interested. So we have to start getting small. I mean, small, smart. Be, yeah, we're acting small, but we need to get smart <laughs> sure. because you, you always have to look at, you know, and the reason I found him, because I went to a dentist in San Diego that was supposed to be so great. And he told me I had to start with $5,600 worth of work that had to be done immediately. Then he would get to the rest. And I go, really? Um, well, okay, something doesn't feel right about this, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, um, you know, went to someone else and said, hey, I'm more of a natural person. This seems really invasive, what he's saying and all that. He goes, well, actually, we could just do this and this. And then I found this gentleman. But people don't want to do what it is because it's, you know, it's like, it's so funny. Um, we want to be healthy. We don't want to be sick. We don't want to be on medication. We want to wake up. And yet we're doing everything we can to sabotage and toxify ourselves. Mm -hmm. He said one of the worst things you can do is have a root canal because yeah. the body actually gets rid of toxins through the teeth at night. Yeah. And so we're just poisoning in our entire system when we do uh, traditional dentistry. But um, you mentioned lotions. If they ever stop, like I start, I was taking pictures several years ago. I started taking pictures of things because I can pick up a product. I put it, I kind of clear and I put it next to me and I stand with slightly bent knees. And because I was trained with... Um, Dr. Hawkins, Power Versus Force. I went to Sedona, took a training so I could body test myself. But it's easier to do it this other way that he trained me, that either it's a slight forward push or a slight energy backward push. So back is no. Mm -hmm. You know, where you're not going anywhere, it's neutral. It's whatever you want. And then forward, it's a yes. And I started testing things that I'd been using, like face lotions and body lotions and and I was getting all these huge backward pulls. And a lot of this stuff wasn't cheap. Mm -hmm. So I started taking pictures of everything and then researching what they were. And you know what? They don't have to put everything on there. That's another thing. When I started digging, they don't have to put when it's a certain amount of something on there. It, and it's always like, wait a minute. You know, and you find out that is the most toxic thing in there. Like, um, and we're putting it on our skin the biggest organ in our body. Mm -hmm. So it's seeping, like even in essential oil, when I use it, I tell people, you've got to mix it with a carrier. They talk about meat. Neat is fine once in a while, but it's very hard on the liver. So when you put it on, it goes right into the bloodstream. Um, you put something under your tongue, right into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even anything that's going in your mouth is going right into the body on your skin right into your body. And so why are our cells breaking down? Why is there more acidity in, in the body? Why is it hard, the, the, you know, the white T count is low and that's the fighter of this garbage? Well, it's because we have such an acidic diet, number one. Number two, the products we're using, our shampoo, I mean, sorry, you know, I didn't do my hair because I thought we were doing this at one and not 11, <laughs> but I took a quick shower yeah. um, and used an, a, um, a filter that has a vitamin C things in it that my dentist told me about. I don't have to use shampoo anymore. Mm -hmm. And it goes right into my body. You know, this, this really clean, not only water, but also vitamin C. So yeah, it's just this awareness. Start looking what we're, we're doing to this temple. And, you know, what are we doing to it? And, and um, we have to honor it because if we don't honor it, no one else is going to. No one else is going to. I think it's um, understanding 
understanding the body and actually taking time to learn how it works as well. So that's been my real mission of, you know, just, just kind of taking a look at where I was being blind to certain things. And I've been lucky in that I've never had any major health challenges, but it doesn't mean that one day, you know, and I've, I've been pretty, you know, pretty on top of it, but it only takes one thing, you know, to, to, to kind of lean into and tip you over. And, you know, especially when I, I was kind of having a period of, of just kind of dealing and healing, I was seeing, I was like observing how much I was really using sugar and I was really conscious of it. And um, when I really started to look at it, I, I, I almost had a vision of me. Do, I, I did the same thing when I was a child and I was going through a lot of hard times. I would turn to, to like biscuits and cakes more than anything else. And then I could see myself years later coping with the same thing and it's one thing doing that when you're a kid it's a different thing doing it when you're older now and all the things that you can trick yourself into diabetes very quickly you know um so so it was for me to really understand what does sugar actually do when sugar is so prevalent in pretty much everything <laughs> that there is you know even the savory goods that we have so I, I really started to um educate myself on the on the way that the body worked and I was you know and I'm one that loves learning and loves researching and finding out and we live in such an amazing time that at the push of a button you can have a video you can have blog posts of individuals who are passionate about teaching people how the body works and I've learned so much and it's become you know, if I want to do all of these things, I need to get my health in check. And one of the things that I've really started to understand is the difference between running the body on sugar and, and running the body on on other sources like fat sources. And, and, and also, um, I don't know if you do this, but really looking at the benefits of things like intermittent fasting and how that helps the body and the fact that we've been trained to be constantly eating, you know, and, and that in itself just keeps people in this kind of confused state because I know how I feel when I eat too much the way that I see it is because so many people are so they're, they're kept in a, such a narrow band of you work at a job that's only going to give you so much really so you don't really have that much time to take time out or you don't feel that you have that much time you don't really get given that many resources because you're only paid just enough to kind of keep you coming back for more and not doing anything so you're caught in this wheel really so then to try and break out of that I would change your diet where you're going to get policed by your circle you know it's that one person who wants to go on a diet or wants to turn vegan or you know that gets sabotaged by everyone around them because deep down they don't want anyone to kind of step out of the change and or, or be left behind in any kind of way um but that's one of the things that and it, I and I've, I'm what I'm feeling now also for myself is how I'm approaching it in a much more empowered way as well and it's more of a journey of learning and it's a more of a journey of excitement even whereas before it was like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna not eat sugar and not and it felt like I was denying myself all of these things whereas with knowledge it's like these things are not doing my body any favors I've been given a privilege I've been given an extra privilege that I've managed to dodge anything that could have fallen my way considering the habits that I was kind of falling into you know I was lucky that I came out of that unscathed um I know that you've been you've been you don't you don't eat wheat as well I remember you mentioning that one time before I do eat wheat because it's in everything but I try to stay away from it like I found um really good raviolis that are not wheat based at all they're like um rice based um they're amazing and I you know I keep finding things that, that aren't wheat and when I serve them people don't know they're not wheat there are some things that are you know some of the vegan things are like ugh. I mean they they're like cardboard to me but it's finding those products and then talking to other people that do so it's unfortunate about wheat because even if it's organic, it's contaminated because of how this everything from GMOs has blown into corn, it's blown into wheat, and it's in everything. And like you said, sugar is in everything. And so I do find the products, but you have to be really careful not to get be fooled by the marketing people that that's that's what they get paid huge bucks for. And people have to remember that. 
to promote something based on a lie. Like, I think it's Annie's that got bought out several years ago. There's several companies that were bought out. And if you read, like my mother stopped at the grocery store. She says, well, I, this is Annie's pizza. It's frozen, but it's just a good backup for me. And I said, she said, it's organic. Look, it's organic. And I said, no, mom, look what the wording is. Organic tomatoes. That means the rest of it's not organic. There is no approval on there. It might say GMO free, but that doesn't mean it's not, it's organic. Um, and so I had to show her, okay, look, look at the side of the box. Nothing else is organic, but they put organic really big and it's tomatoes, you know, and it's like, it's so deceitful, especially for an older generation that is actually um, believing that these people care about them. It's so wrong, you know, they really don't. It, you, it's like finding, again, it's not beating yourself up for doing something like you said about sugar. Mm -hmm. um, sugar's in everything. I can definitely tell when I've had sugar because I get amped up. Um, and even this morning, I'm not as grounded because I did have tea and on Sunday I have biscotti that my sister-in-law makes. Mm -hmm. So I didn't eat anything that was really solid you know, um, that I would normally drink, uh, you know, like a juice for myself, you know, fresh vegetables and things like that. So I really can tell when I'm out of sync. So it's not not doing something, even though my sh friend Shannon, I knew at Christmas time and through, that's the hardest time of the year to give up sugar and wheat, right? So we did a challenge. We, I think it was 38. We did it on Instagram under our Ascension Angels. Um, Instagram account. And, um, you know, we challenged, we did it a 38 because we figured January 2nd was 38 days. And then we said, let's start now. It really helps when you do it with someone else. Mm -hmm. So no wheat and no sugar. And we were both amazed how easy it was doing it with someone else. Just checking in every morning. Hey, how'd you do? You know, Hey, I was tempted, but I thought about you and we would call each other okay, I'm going to a party, keep me strong, send me vibes, <laughs> you know, and it was really amazing. Um, because when I go usually through the Christmas season, even though I'm not a sugar person, because I know usually it means that I'm lacking protein. So I'll go make something an avocado sandwich with, you know, something, you know, lettuce and spinach and with sauteed spinach and this and that, whatever. And so it grounds me and I don't, I get what actually my body needs instead of what parasites or something else is craving mm -hmm. um so it was it was good to do but the minute i got out off of it the deal was then on the second of january we could have sugar we could have cookies we could have whatever we want and i didn't want it because mm -hmm. i got it out of my system my body which is you know um and it took it was just uh, my sister-in-law sent me this biscotti homemade um, a week ago. That was the first time I've had sugar. So in that time, and thank goodness she knows my thing about sugar. So she said, she even wrote, I used a third of what they required. And, and I, I think that's another thing too. I don't go out to eat as much anymore because I realize it, the most expensive restaurants are in this Napa Valley, especially in like Yonville. They're all very expensive. And nobody's got organic. There's only one restaurant that has organic, and that's the French Laundry. And you can go there for four hundred dollars for lunch, and about twelve hundred dollars you'll get out for dinner for two. Um, lunch is just one, but um, you know. And it's like this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Like people are paying really good money for bad food. It's it's amazing. So again, do it with someone else. And don't, yeah. don't be hard on yourself. Just like cut back, cut back, cut back. I used to drink coffee all the time. Like I'd have to have one cup in the morning and it was like my ritual, one cup, you know, um, with cream, half and half. And, and that's all I wanted. But it still made me jittery. It made me slightly out of focus because I am super sensitive. And then I went to a good organic decaf. And then I found Rishi only the the big red box because it's it is more expensive but um it's also more in, in each tea bag but they're english breakfast when i brew that and put 
half and half for milk in it um, or almond milk. I don't, I have to be honest. I don't like almond milk in my coffees or teas. Um, I have to then do like an organic half and half or, or at least a whole milk. And I didn't need coffee. I did not crave, I have not craved coffee in over a year when I thought that was the one thing I would never be able to give up. I, not only do I not crave it, I don't want it. Like if somebody offers, it's like, no, I, I don't. So it's finding that substitute. You know, what is it that we're going to get that same sense of what was it about the coffee? It wasn't the coffee. Um, it was a sense of um, starting out a ritual in the morning and wh whatever it was, you know. So, yeah. So Good. Yeah, I like really what you said about, about parasites. <laughs> uh, I actually stopped eating. Um, I mean, it, it's it's not I'm not completely sugar free, but in terms of like going for sweet things when I, it was on Christmas Eve, when I realized I was eating these mince pies, I'm like, I've got to stop. And I can't even wait until the first to do it with the whole world. I need to stop there and then. And, and I had to turn it into a game, at least for the first week or so, that every time I had those cravings, I'm like, I'm going to starve the parasites. I'm going to, st you know, it, it became this like standoff <laughs> between, <laughs> between, <that> looked out? <laughs> between, between me and the parasites. I'm like, they're not going to win. They're not going to win. And then, you know, they're quiet now. So it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. It just meant when, when the new year came around and everyone was making their resolutions that I was already like a week ahead. I just needed to do it there and then. I knew waiting another week wasn't, re wasn't going to help me any further. I just had to kind of put a stamp in it for that. Yeah, no, it's been great, yeah. great, great kind of just like going over and just seeing how um, you're managing you know feeding our body which then in turn kind of feeds our energy and our awareness and and it's all it's all so connected and and just more and more people are becoming aware of they need to be healthier they need to try and be healthier they're being more aware of pharmaceuticals and not really helping them in the main you know the majority of people are not getting the results that they believe that they're getting from it but are still not sure where to go and and um bit by bit I want to just ask you the her conversations questions that I ask all of my guests so the first question is what is the best piece of advice a woman has ever given to you trust yourself go in and trust yourself and really tap into who you are and not uh, what society says you should be. It's almost like the remembrance when you came in as a child. Um, there was a knowing until we got it beat out of us. <laughs> but trust <laughs> ourselves. Yeah, I think really listen to what people have to say, but then check in with our own body, our own soul, mm. and say, does this resonate with me? And, you know, sometimes it can be a yes, because people used to say this preacher, that preacher, oh my God, they're a horrible person. Why is that person following them? It's like, because that's what they need to hear right now. So that preacher is the perfect person, or that politician is the perfect person, mm -hmm. because they're going to get to a point where then they start, there's a part of them that goes, okay, something's not right here. And we keep refining and refining and refining. So it's just a step. It's not anything, there's nothing that's bad or good because each is a step for us to grow and expand. So I guess trust yourself when you get that inner knowing and don't let people talk it out. But that doesn't mean shut them off. We, I'm always open to listening to another point of view, but then I check in and say, is this truth for me? And if it's no, then I just bless it and let it go. That doesn't mean it won't be truth for me down the road where I go, oh, I didn't see this aspect. Mm. But it's just taking your time to get to know you um, and how your body, even with food, like you said, our, it's responding, our, our environment, everything. Just think of what this body has taken on, the energy of all these things happening, you know, chemicals and chemtrails and vaccines and you know, animal life in us or, you know, people, they get organs, uh, transplants, they say they've taken the energy of that person on. And sometimes it can be horrible, mm -hmm. um, you know, where they go into deep depression and they go into suicidal thoughts. And then they find out later, that's, that's what the person was going through. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that's probably why it's a good reason not to eat animal also, because same thing, we're taking on that energy. And if we want to be connected to our highest divine self, we have to clear 
our everything that wasn't God given. Everything. And um, what what woman represents higher energetic resonance to you? I don't think there's any one particular woman. I think all the women that I meet that are on a journey um, of self-knowing and willing to stand in their truth, no matter what anybody else says and be authentic, uh, no matter what anybody else is saying or doing. Um, yeah, I, I don't have one particular woman that I will, no, it's women in general that are really, also, you know, as women, we've got, uh, we were trained to really step on each other for a very long time to mm -hmm. succeed. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing that finally, um, you know, that women aren't smiling in your face and having a dagger behind their back. But yeah. that took a long time to undo. And, um, and it's really interesting because my thing on life was always about to promote the other. To, to me, if I don't help someone be more than I am, even, you know, my children or my friends or uh, somebody I'm coaching, I haven't done my job. So I always looked at that as a failure. If I, you know, people, all the businesses I've owned, my objective was to train that people actually got better than me or I didn't feel I did my job. I was never a person that wanted to feel superior to anyone. Um, so I think, you know, anybody that is really here for the highest good of all um, is really my, my ideal woman. <laughs> and what are your favorite self-care rituals and, and practices? Uh, the favorite are when I, I usually wake up when it's still dark, especially this time of year. But um, I have just to make sure I have one of those little fake but look real candles um, mm -hmm. that go at five o'clock in the morning. It bings on, you know. So even if I'm not really awake, it kind of stirs me to the OK, let's get up because I'm one of those people that need hours <laughs> before <laughs> I do anything in the day. Like my whole morning until 10 or 11 is ritual and um, me, it's about me. Um, it's about getting up um, and I'll meditate um, and I usually light a candle and sometimes I put on uh, an incense or some really beautiful music uh, that on the side that's just really soft. And, and so, but it's still in the dark. I don't turn a light on except for that little candle because once I get woken up, like light goes on and all that, I then I'm somehow start diving into this three dimensional world. Um, and so I do, I just, even if it's, you know, if somebody only spends 10 minutes in meditation starts breathing, cause sometimes I'll say, oh my gosh, you know, I have so much to do. I'm just gonna do 10 minutes. But when you go into that deep breathing and just surrendering, you don't want to come out mm. so that 10 minutes can be, you know, 30 minutes or an hour or whatever. So that's, that's what I start with. And, I, you know, um, then sometimes I get up and I'll use some crystal bowls or I'll use my Tibetan bowl um, and play it for a few minutes. And then I journal. And, and there are some times that I've woken up in the night and basically I get this little ding. Um, it's like a chime or a bell. It can be a sound like a phone it can sound like a doorbell anything that chimes in I'm like oh oh somebody's no the phone's not ringing no because my phone's turned off and and it's just a wake-up call to say we have something to share so yeah. whatever that higher consciousness that higher group of beings whatever I don't try to label it I get up I get my journal and I start writing whatever I hear mm -hmm. so that's another thing so the ritual changes it could be writing first and then meditation and then I go get my tea, you know, and, and um, spend more time writing or watching something that's uplifting. And, you know, I don't, like I said, <laughs> sometimes when my phone doesn't even go on. It's on, it's on um, airplane mode until sometimes 11 o'clock. And, and then I'll go, oh my gosh, I'm still in airplane <laughs> mode. <laughs> and then the world wakes me up. Perfect. And can you just let us know if you've got anything coming and where people can find you online in terms of your channel, your mm -hmm. website? The funnest thing that's coming right now is that my new company, which my friend Shannon, um, it's called AscensionAngels.com. But we also have another 
ULR that's easy. It's 1111angel.com and that takes you there too. So sign up. It's all energy healing tools, anything to uplift you, anything to help you on your journey. I love creating beauty on magic and that's what we're about right now. I still am getting um, lots of sales on Amazon through my book, The Awakening Ones. And that's been a joy too, because I've been finding people from all walks of life. And it was a little bit, because I'm challenging uh, the Vatican, basically. I, I thought, ah, I'm going to get some flack from some people. But I have gotten people from all over the world, all walks of life. That, and one gentleman, he said, yeah, um, he said, I, I'm very indoctrinated into the Christian Catholic religion and all my friends are too. And he was from not Jamaica, somewhere like that. But anyway, he said, you've brought up lots of discussion for my friends and I, and it was really important. So that's another thing that even though I'm not one of those people selling millions of books, it, it, it's not why I did it. You know, I really had to. And that's what I was asked when I was woken up in the night. Um, if I only sold one book to one person that made a difference, would all this effort be okay? Mm. And when the answer was yes, I knew I just had to go forward. It wasn't about, you know, making money from it. It wasn't about success or anything like that. Actually, I don't even like, like that really. Um, because I like my privacy, so God forbid, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, so thank you for asking that. That's no problem, and and I just want to say thank you for, for finally we get together and, and get to have this conversation, it took a moment, but it, it just worked out perfectly, I feel. Yeah, and you know, it was, it was really nice to connect with you when I was in Italy, and we mm -hmm. were um, Zooming, and, <laughs> um, and then watch, you know, watch like, okay, what's she doing? She's kind of stepped back and what's going on here and searching, looking again, listening to some of your music and just loving it. And, you know, going back to some of your old blog posts and podcasts and now well, what's up with her? You know, she's, she's probably where I am right now, yeah. cleaning out all the old and um, emerging from the, emerging from the dust. You know? <laughs> yeah. It was a it was a different and I, I tried to keep things going for, for a little while as well. But, you know, running a podcast, you know, when you're producing content, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes before you just put, you know, one little bit of content onto the Internet. It takes a lot of things to get it together. And I just didn't feel that I was able to do it in the way that I had to the level that I had before, because something else was calling me back to actually sit down and really assess the situation mm -hmm. and you know look at like you say before the, the the parts of you that you know when people are speaking to you and they say something and it hits home there's a part of you that believes it because if you didn't believe it it, it would have just run off your back and you would you would have walked away from it but the fact that it kind of hits you when you're then standing defending yourself and and trying to prove people wrong it's like hang on what am I not hearing about myself and and you know interesting that you're saying about the blog posts and and the music it was I was just speaking to someone the other day and I was saying do you know what I in it, during that time I allowed someone who had not made any kind of not put anything out into the world in any way shape or form to really be down on the things that I was doing and I didn't give myself the credit for the fact that over the years I have written blog posts you know for I used to blog twice a twice a year <laughs> twice a week for like almost four years until I put the podcast done I realized I had to do one or the other I put music out I wrote a book I traveled you know and I didn't give myself credit <laughs> for any of those things I just let one one little comment just kind of wipe me out I'm like I need to remember who the hell I am so <laughs> it took a moment of just really cleaning out and, and going to the core of stuff and I'm starting to rebuild and, and come back on a completely different opinion of myself I didn't realize I had such a low opinion of myself it was a revelation to me and now things have changed for sure interesting isn't it it's mm. um you know I, I think that's the first clue that you're not in your soul self um your high high self is when we defend yeah. and it's because why would we defend anything you know a, you know, if we're content in who we are, 
and we know we're doing our best, no matter what it is, it's not going to bother us. So therefore, when we defend is automatic, you know, ooh, there's a lesson here, uh, you know, and also who am I listening to? Do I admire this person's life? No, <laughs> why the hell would they make a difference to my opinion of myself, yeah. you know, or about anything? So it is, a, it's, it's a one, it's actually wonderful. The moment we feel that we're defending, it's like to learn to stop cold and go, what am I defending myself with you with for? And then walking away, that'll get their attention. You know, they'll probably go, what do you mean? What do you mean with me? And it's like, I don't admire your life. So what am I even listening to this for? <laughs> and I happen to like myself. Hmm. So I've done amazing things and you don't need to explain it. That's yeah. another thing, right? When we have to explain it to people, what we've done to justify who we are, you know, I mean, seriously, a monk sitting on a hill that hasn't done anything for three years isn't going to justify where he is or what he's doing, but he might be in total bliss. So, mm. you know, so what? So, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. I yeah. love it. It's been great. Well, thank you so much. Mm, it's so good thank. to be with you. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and we'll keep supporting each other. And who knows, one day we might re meet in, in the flesh and in real life, you know? Yes. Next time I head to, head to Italy to see my son and grandchildren and daughter-in-law, I'll have to stop in, in London. <laughs> let me know. Well, let me know as well. It's, it's not so far away from the UK, you know. Let me, let me do it before, before things yeah. get tricky for me to go to Europe as well. You know? <laughs> let me get it with all that's going on here. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay. All right, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Have a gorgeous day. Thank you, Angelica, for joining me on this episode of Her Conversations. And thank you for listening. You can find out more about me, Carol May Wittick, on my website, which is carolmaywittick.com. That's C-A-R-O-L-M-A-E-W-H-I-T-T-I-C-K. And you can follow me on Facebook under the same name. And my Instagram handle is Kazmik. That's at C-A-Z-M-I-C-K. So take care until next week and the next episode. Thank you. Bye.